Hey, you cool chemistry cats. Let's talk about balancing chemical reaction equations. So in the last video lecture, we talked about how to write chemical reaction equations. And now it's time for us to talk about how to make sure that they are balanced. Or in other words, make sure that they are adhering to the law of conservation of mass. First of all, I want you to take a look at this reaction right here and answer the question, how does the chemical equation that you're seeing violate the law of conservation of mass. So if you're looking at this equation up here, you might at this point think there's nothing wrong with that, right? That seems pretty consistent with what you'd expect to see after writing a chemical reaction equation similar to what you learned in the last video. This is telling you that solid aluminum and gaseous bromine react to form solid aluminum bromide. So why is that actually not a true statement? Why is this right here not an okay thing for us to have written down as our final reaction? Well, it's because it doesn't follow the law of conservation of mass. If you think about it and if you visualize it, there is one aluminum here in the reactants and one aluminum over here in the product, so that's fine. But right here, there are two bromine atoms in the reactants and three bromine atoms in the products. So somewhere along the line, a bromine atom just appeared out of nothingness. And as you know, mass cannot be created or destroyed. So it is impossible, thing, impossible for things to just appear out of nowhere. It's also impossible for things to just disappear into nowhere. So this is not actually what's going on. What we have to do is we have to balance this equation. We have to make sure that it looks more like this. So in the reaction between solid aluminum, gaseous bromine, those two things to make solid aluminum bromide, this is what's really going to happen. It's not just going to be one of each of these makes one of these. It's going to take two aluminums, three diatomic bromines reacting together to make two aluminum bromides because now this is balanced. In other words, there's the same amount of atoms of each thing on each side of the equation. There are two aluminum atoms on both sides, and there are six bromine atoms on both sides. That follows the law of conservation of mass. Nothing is being created or destroyed. So this is the actual reaction. When you have these things reacting together, it's going to be two of these and three of these making two of these. It is not possible for one of these and one of these to make one of these. That's not what's going to happen. So one thing that I want to just point out real fast and make sure everyone is clear on this is that there are two different types of numbers that we use in chemical reaction equations, coefficients and subscripts. The coefficients are the numbers that are written before a chemical formula to indicate how many molecules of that thing are present in the reaction. Now, subscripts are written after and below, because they're subscripts, a specific element to indicate how many of those atoms are present. Or sometimes they're after a polyatomic ion or some other group of atoms to tell you how many of those groups are in that particular compound. Now, that might not seem like an important distinction, but it's very, very important that you don't mix these things up and start thinking that one is the other. It's really important that you treat them each as what they are. So I'll probably reference that back when we do some examples at the end of this lecture. So we want to be able to balance chemical equations. And there's basically three steps that you're going to follow with kind of a fourth step that is just to simplify if it's necessary. And I'm going to talk you through those three steps right now. And then I'll show you some, two examples at the end of the video um, to, to exemplify what I'm talking about. So first, first step is to write the chemical equation. That's what the last video lecture was about. And that is, of course, the first step in this process. You have to make sure that you are working with an accurate chemical equation. Now, some things to keep in mind are listed down below here. You have to make sure that each of your co compound formulas is correct. You have to make sure that all your reactants are on the left and your products are on the right. You have to make sure that you're using an arrow to separate your reactants from your products and not an equal sign. It's a common mistake. If you know physical states, you can include those as subscript letters in parentheses, um, but sometimes you won't always know those. And lastly, 
you need to make sure to watch out for diatomic molecules, which was covered at the end of the last video. Once you have a working, accurate chemical equation, you're going to make a t-chart that will help you to count how many atoms of each element involved are on the reactant side and how many are on the product side. And this is going to be also the structure we use to then balance the equation. And this is really where it's important to know how coefficients and subscripts are different and how they apply differently to compounds. I think the examples at the end will help make that clearer. And then step three is you're simply going to change the coefficients, the numbers written in front of each compound, in order to make the equation balanced. Now that's actually a little bit more difficult than that makes it sound, because you're going to have to do this kind of in a stepwise function, one coefficient at a time, and you might have to make multiple rounds of changes in order to finally get to something that's balanced but a couple really important things to keep in mind. First of all, you can never, ever, ever change your subscripts. The subscripts always stay the same. If you change subscripts, what you're doing is you're changing the compounds that are involved. You're not just balancing the equation, you're actually changing the compounds that are involved, which means you're changing the reaction. And so you can't do that. Also, this is more just advice, make one change at a time. Change one coefficient and then update your t-chart as you go along to make sure you don't want to try and just balance the whole thing necessarily in one step because you might confuse yourself more by doing that. And lastly, this is just, again, a little bit of advice. I would personally start with large compounds first and then save the smaller molecules and even diatomic elements for later. That generally makes the balancing process go a little bit more smoothly. And then step number four, which is really kind of an optional step if necessary, is to simplify. Sometimes when you're balancing an equation, you'll add in coefficients and you'll get kind of carried away and those coefficients will get really big. So it's important at the end to think about if those coefficients have a common denominator. And if so, you can divide them all by that common denominator in order to simplify them down to the smallest set of coefficients necessary to make sure the equation is balanced. So those are the steps to balancing equations, and you're probably thinking, wow, that doesn't make any sense without some sort of an example to apply that to. Well, here you go. Here's an example, and we'll walk through it together. So here's our chemical equation. It is not balanced yet, and here's the T-chart. This is what your T-chart should look like. You list out all the elements that are involved in the reaction, and then make a column for how many are in the reactants and how many are in the products. So let's start with that. Let's determine how many of each element are on each side of the reaction and then balance the equation. Now, what uh, color should I use for this? I'm hearing orange. Let's do orange. There is currently one silver atom in the, on the reactant side of this reaction because there's no subscripts and no coefficients that correspond to that element. So there's just one of them, and I'm writing it over here for a reason. There's also one iodine. There are two sodiums, because that subscript means that there are two of those there, and then there's one sulfur. Now on the product side, there are two silvers, one sulfur, one sodium, and one iodine. And I apologize, I'm not super great with writing with my mouse, so just bear with me. Now, as you can see, these are not balanced, right? There's an imbalance in terms of silver and sodium on either side. So what we're going to do is we're just going to start kind of changing coefficients in order to make things balanced. And this is, in a way, kind of a guess and check method. You can always reverse your balancing efforts if you find that you're going in the wrong direction. So I'm going to start at the top and say, well, there's not enough silver on the left-hand side. And that's kind of how you have to think about it. You can always increase how much of something is on one of the sides. You can never decrease it. I can't go over here and make this a one, right? There's no coefficient I can add here to cut the number of silvers on the product side down to one. And I can't change the subscript because then I would be changing the compound. So all I can do is add a two over here. Now this two applies to this whole compound, so that changes the number of silvers that are on the reactant side to two, and it changes the number of iodines to two as well. 
So now our silver are balanced, but our iodines got unbalanced. That's okay. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you make something, something balanced and in the process make something else unbalanced. That's usually part of the process. So let's just go down the list. Let's try and make iodines balanced next. Well, there's two on the reactants and one on the product. So let's see if we can add some more to the products. Let's put a two here. And that means that now there's two sodiums and two iodines on the product side. And look at that. We now have a balanced reaction. There's two silvers, two iodines, two sodiums, and one sulfur on each side of the reaction equation. So this is, in reality, what's going to happen with this chemical reaction. This is an appropriately balanced chemical reaction equation. Let's clear the board here and do one more. And I'm going to do a fairly complicated one just to show you kind of some of the confusions that people run into and um, how you can use that simple set of tools no matter how complicated the reaction is to make sure that you eventually get to something that's balanced. So let's get our orange pen back out again. Here's our new reaction equation. And on the reactant side, there's one calcium, two chlorines, three sodiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. On the product side, there's three calciums. Oh, this is tricky. This subscript applies to this entire thing in parentheses. It's saying that within this compound, there are two of those phosphate ions. So that means that there's two phosphorus and eight oxygens. I'm going to multiply it because if there's four in every phosphorus and there's two phosphorus in the compound, that means there's eight oxygens total. And then there's one sodium and one chlorine. Okay, this thing is all kinds of unbalanced. So again, we'll just kind of start from the top since all of these are complicated um, compounds. There's nothing that is more really longer than any of the others. I guess these are a little bit longer than these, but we're just going to kind of start at the top of the list and try to balance as we go. So let's try and get these calciums balanced. Well, if there's three over here and we can't decrease how many are in the products, we need to increase how many are in the reactants. So let's try just putting a three in front of this. That's going to increase the number of calciums on the reactant side to three, and it's also going to change the number of chlorines. Now this coefficient applies to this entire compound. It's telling you that there are three of these calcium chlorides involved in the reaction. So that means that if there's two chlorines in each calcium chloride, and there's three calcium chlorides, there's a total of six chlorines. Okay, so now our chlorines are all out of whack, so let's try and address that. Let's see if we can increase the number of chlorines over here to get that balanced. If we add a 6 in front of the NaCl, that's going to increase our chlorines to 6, and it's also going to increase our sodiums to 6. Okie dokie, we're, we are making progress, believe it or not. Our sodiums are out of balance. Everything else is still out of balance, but we've gotten the first two. So how could we try to increase our number of sodiums on the reactant side in order to make this balanced? Well, if we put a 2 here, this 2 tells you that there's two of this entire thing. So in terms of sodium, there's six of them there. Here's another tool that you can use. Whenever you're, uh, whenever you're looking at a particular element within a compound, you're just going to figure out what numbers correspond to that element and you're going to multiply them together. So for this sodium, it's followed by a 3 subscript, and it's preceded by a 2 coefficient. So that means that both of those numbers correspond to that atom or that element. So if you multiply 3 and 2, there's 6 of them there. Likewise, this 2 coefficient applies to this phosphorus, and there's no other subscript, so there's 2 phosphorus there. And then again, this 2 also applies to the oxygen. The 4 also applies to the oxygen. So if the 2 and the 4 both apply to the oxygen, multiply them together, there's 8 oxygens there. And kablamo! This thing is balanced. Now it never hurts 
to go back and double check a couple of things. First of all, like I mentioned, if there was a way to simplify this, we might want to simplify it. So well, after you're balancing, after you're done balancing, you need to look at each of the coefficients and think, is there a common denominator that I could divide those by in order to simplify them? And the answer in this case is no. 3, 2, and 6 are not all divisible by anything in common. So these are actually the lowest coefficients that you can use to balance this equation. The other thing that I would recommend doing is just simply, once you've balanced your equation, go back and recount and make sure that it's actually balanced. So I would like put my finger on the calcium and say, all right, there's three of those. And then on the product side, there's three of those. Calcium is balanced. Chlorines, there's six on the left-hand side. And look, there's six on the right-hand side. That's balanced. There's six sodiums, six sodiums. That's balanced. Two phosphorus, two phosphorus, balanced. And eight oxygen, eight oxygen. So it never hurts to just double check and make sure that you are all balanced. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you balance chemical reaction equations. One of my tiles fell off. Oh, it's over there. One of my tiles fell off uh, during the middle of recording this video. Um, so good thing you didn't see that disaster. All right, let us know if you have any questions. There's gonna be a lot of practice posted for you to get used to this balancing process, but just let one of us know if you have any questions and don't forget to take your quiz so that you are good for the rest of the week. All right, until next time, keep it real, you cool chemistry cats.